us. Hi, good morning once again. Thank you all for joining us today. And you know, our topic today is visual design, visual design for learners. Um, before going to, the, to our main session, let me um, introduce our subject matter expert today. Um, it is our privilege to um, <clears throat> get her in our today's session. So Gabriela Klekova is a university professor, language teacher, teacher trainer, researcher, consultant, and materials developer. She has a master's degree in education in TEFL from University of West Bohemia, where she is now chair of, of department and an AMA and PhD in applied linguistics from the University of Memphis, Tennessee, USA. Gabriela has taught a wide range of general English courses and TESOL professional courses for pre-service and in-service teachers. Her research interests include the effectiveness and utility of visual design of ELT materials, teacher education, innovation in education, and leadership. For TESOL's 50th anniversary, she was named one of the 30 emerging leaders shaping the future of profession. Congratulations, Gabriela. Uh, Gabriela Keklova is TESOL International Association. Um, I can see the screen here. <laughs> uh, I think she's the chair for- to, uh, The president for 2021-2022. Okay, welcome once again, Gabriela. Thank you, Uma. Good morning um, to everybody. Yes. Yeah, so as you know, our session starts with uh, introductory question and then discussion question. And finally, we go to breakout rooms with our participants. So I'm going to move on to our um, first introductory question. Um, Uh, what is document design and why it is important? So this is our first introductory question and I'm passing the floor to Gabriela. So Gabriela, it's for you now. What is document okay. and why it is important? Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning again to everybody. Uh, thank you for being here in the morning. I hear uh, it's usually in the evening. So there's a little change uh, starting uh, uh, in 2022, having a morning session. Um, it was said that I'm a uh, I'm an expert. <laughs> that makes me laugh. Um, uh, but I, I'm not. It, it just happened to be. I'm not a big expert. I, it just happened to be that uh, in my uh, PhD studies at the University of Memphis, I had an. A, um, it was a. A PhD program that was an a, um, that integrated all the disciplines present in the English department, and one of them was technical writing or professional writing at that time, and that kind of informed. And I started taking courses in that field, um, and it kind of informed um, how I look at documents that I, as a language teacher, develop. So that's just provide you a little bit of background. I don't have any uh, graphic design background. I'm just a uh, regular teacher um, and administrator and who happened to have some um, um, courses in something and then pulling it all together. Uh, I did uh, at the end, pulled it together um, in a book, but that's uh, that's past now and I'm, I'm moving on with some other things. But um, I'm always happy to share the topic with everybody. Um, so I think there is not enough awareness about the importance of the subject matter in the English language teaching world or um, and that includes even programs and anybody working in our field in, in general in education. And uh, I'll start with a metaphor to say what is document design, uh, maybe it was something that we all are familiar with and that's planning. Uh, you may be in the classroom these days or you may not. Uh, you may have all the other positions, but um, uh, lesson plan, uh, why do we create a lesson plan? We have some ideas and the lesson plan helps us to organize the ideas. And uh, from the, all the chaos that we have in our hats, it helps us to organize and then build uh, a certain flow and structure to the lesson so the students can can learn what we would like them to learn. And similarly in design, as White says, uh, to design is, means to plan. And what we do is we plan our documents. And that's a very sim simple definition, what document design is. But in my very simple understanding is like planning a document in a way that it achieves its purpose. And it can be to instruct, it can be to inform, or it can be to 
uh, maybe convince somebody of something, depending on the rhetorical situation. But it's basically putting together the text and the graphics and wrapping it up in a certain way. So what we are sharing either is um, said in a way where people will understand it, or it's hidden in all the little things that we tend to uh, do, uh, thinking that it's the right thing, but it's not. We'll be, uh, I think, addressing the question later. Uh, so document design helps and supports what we are communicating. It's the packaging uh, that we're using in, um, uh, or the visual language is the packaging that uh, we use to communicate our message and ideas. And why it's important, uh, it, uh, it can support comprehension or it can complicate one's um, uh, uh, comprehension, or it can also make somebody feel that they're stupid. And an example would be a poorly designed uh, uh, textbook uh, can, uh, uh, can confuse learners. And very often, if you're a second language learner and the language that you're learning is foreign to you, uh, uh, you may feel uh, stupid that you can find something, but it has nothing to do with your ability to comprehend teacher's instructions. It has to do with poorly designed material. And I use an uh, example of a textbook because very often as professionally done, the textbooks are, we often find some flaws in the design and, it, and the design itself is not supportive of language learners or anybody using the document. So I'll stop here now, just a little, hopefully clear understanding what, what I or how I understand document design, why I think it's important. And I would be interested to hear what you have to say about it and your, your perception of document design or Thank why you. it matters. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. That was a great overview of um, what document design is. But of course, we're interested to hear from you. So what is document design to our audience? Uh, you could use the chat box. Remember, you could also raise your hand and unmute yourself and share with us why is it important and, well, what definition you have for document design. Anyone? Yes, Susan. And then Victoria. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Just a quick comment that I, I would like to raise the idea of universal design and access in everything that we do, including document design. Thank you. That's a great topic, Susan. UDL, Universal Design for Learning. Uh, that's a great topic to discuss, especially taking into account the various uh, students we have in our classrooms. Thank you. Victoria, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Oh, let me see if there is my video. Yes. Okay. Do you see me, guys? Mm, oh, I see myself. Uh, good morning. I represent Hanson Canada. Very happy to see you, really. I hope this session is going to be interesting. I, um, uh, From my side, I definitely agree, Gabriella, that uh, design of the document is very important. But actually, it's not only for student, uh, students. I truly believe it's unification. Unification helps a lot to be on track. It's very important for the quality. Um, because if uh, there is a mess in the document, if information is presented unclear, it cannot be followed. And actually, uh, from my side as a teacher, it's also, I would say, some type of protection for me. Because if there is something which is followed, actually, uh, there are no, um, I would say, situations where I cannot be incorrect. This is my protection as well, protection by uh, the superiors, protection by policies. And actually, yes, I agree. Students see what should be done, right? So actually, I, I'm a fan of unification. I agree. <laughs> Thank that's you. A, wow, that's a very interesting insight, Victoria. Protection <laughs> in document design. Thank you for bringing that up. Great. Um, let me go to the chat box. And we have Shirosi, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Um, Shirosi is saying that repetition and retention is achieved better. And this links with what Victoria was saying, unification, right? So we repeat and, and then students are able also to um, retain the information. Nice. Um, and then we have Meredith who says the space, the visuals supporting the content. And as designers, we can do that. We can match the content with the visual aspect. And as Susan was saying, the UDL aspect of it as well and the space provided. 
Uh, Jennifer, for me, it's enjoyable to use beautiful looking materials and who doesn't enjoy that, right? So it's fun for us as instructors, as teachers, but also for our students. If you enjoy yeah, that, can I, uh, can I, can I, can sure. I jump in? I, I, I agree. It, it is beautiful. Uh, um, but I would say um, beautiful doesn't equal uh, well-designed. Um, That's true. And, and we'll be looking at it throughout today. And I, and I a hundred percent agree. Um, and I, we often find a beautiful menu in a restaurant, a uh, beautiful looking menu, and then we don't know how to navigate it. Okay, so um, because the, the chef was very creative. But anyway, right. um, I just wanted to say, say that, but I 100% agree. I'm very sensitive to the look of the materials. Right, so if it's functional, it has to be beautiful too, right? <laughs> okay, uh, Joanne. Um, oh, okay, Joanne has a technical issue. No worries, no worries, no problem at all. Uh, Debbie. I fervently feel that it motivates my learners and it assists in comprehension. So we, we're still seeing a connection between uh, comprehension, content, and how students interact with the material. For Uma, it helps to get takeaways easily. Mm -hmm. And as Debbie's saying, it also enhances learners' learning. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, if there's anyone else who would like to share their ideas, that's good. We have so much feedback so far. That's great. So Uma, we could move on to our second question. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> and um, Uma, your oh, microphone. Uma, Uma. You're muted. Could you please unmute yourself? I'm sorry. Um, my bad. Like, what materials do we develop and create for our learners? Mm -hmm. And I should actually say for our colleagues, if we're in schools for the parents of the learners, for the community that we are a part of, for our bosses, <laughs> right? Um, for people that we maybe oversee, like, anybody in our life. And um, But I'll focus it on, um, because I'm an educator, but also um, uh, an administrator. So of course, in the classroom, it's very often the worksheets. And uh, here I, um, um, it can be now we are all in online and we're using the online tools so much more. So it's in the digital format. We're still using Word and other things that we create those materials in. So uh, worksheets, assignment sheets, right? Um, tests, uh, very common. Uh, I think we do we make, uh, don't make flashcards anymore. I'm not in the uh, secondary or primary school uh, anymore, but um, surveys, um, that's another thing that we, uh, when we do, and we're using all those different platforms for, to collect students' input. Um, I think different checklists when it gets to assessment overall, I think there's a lot that we, we develop depending, of course, I don't know how, what, how things are done when it gets to assessment in Canada. I'm a little familiar with the US. And then of course the Czech Republic, but overall, I think if you're working with learners assessment formative for summative, um, it, a lot of materials are involved in that. Uh, but I think we also do contracts and <laughs> or develop contracts with our learners or with whoever we work with. Um, maybe syllabus, you know, we, we uh, create uh, curricular materials. Maybe there is a bulletin or newsletter for our community, maybe even posters for the classroom or uh, for our office, um, instructions, um, and as an administrator, notes to my people in the department. Um, now, as a member of the TESOL Board of Directors, uh, it's agendas, uh, minutes, um, uh, reports, and all these things that we do reports. Uh, have I, I think that's all. Uh, it seems like um, it's a natural part to our professional life is to create and write and communicate and use the language. And it has different forms and I guess different genres, but I'm, I'm interested what do you, what do you, what kind of materials do you create in your, in your professional context? Thank you so much, Gabriela. That was a long list. Wow. <laughs> we do indeed create lots of materials, but yeah, I'd love to hear from our audience as well. So any, any specific materials you create ongoing or, any other ones that were not mentioned as well. Again, please feel free to use the chat box or raise your hand and use your microphone. So it depends on the context for sure. Uh, Jennifer is saying lots of PowerPoints <laughs> or Canva oh, right. presentations. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, 
recommendation letter for students. That's true, Gonol. We do that too. It's part of our, our work. Um, needs assessment. Mm -hmm. Selda is saying that we prepare needs assessment as well. Um, Chinwendu, I'm sorry for mispronunciation. Uh, teaching slides like PowerPoint slides. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. PBLA rubrics and tools. Shazma. Daria uh, Bozdogan says PowerPoint flashcards, infographics, or handouts, as Debbie's saying. Uh, graphic organizing, share fun. Yeah, right. Meredith is, share, is sharing with us that they have made storybooks together, together with your students, Meredith. That's amazing. That's very interesting. Wow. That should have been a very interesting work. Uh, Shazma Collaborative Writing on Docs. We do that too, right? So it's digital uh, material making with our students and for our students. Great ideas. Mm -hmm. Storyboards, Victoria. With students or for students, Victoria, or both? Uh, for students, for top management as well. Mm -hmm. And I also, you know, I run a um, student female community. Actually, we have a lot of activities which are outside the college. And actually, this is one of the parts because we participate in a lot of NGO projects as well. So just whatever Gabriella mentioned, that's all. <laughs> that's all is done. Yes, all definitely. the boxes. <laughs> yeah, Great. All the boxes. Wow, that's great to hear. Uh, Jackie is also sharing that they've made a class movie that the students wrote. Isn't that amazing? They write the script, right? And then they produce and make it. Wow, we are creators here. We are a group of creators today and I'm getting ideas for my own classes now. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. This is great. Okay, good. Uh, recipe book, Susan. Hmm. That's very interesting indeed. Nobody has said party invites. Okay. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. We party are all creators. <laughs> <laughs> to be part of our JD, right? Part of our job description should be creators using our imagination. Jamboard for intro, Shazma. Mm -hmm. Lots of ideas. I have to write them down now. Great, thank you everybody. Okay, poetry and journaling as well. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, <laughs> great, yeah, poetry. Thank you, thank you everyone. This was a great introduction. Uma, let's continue with our last introductory question for today. Mm -hmm. Autobiography, wow. Keep those ideas coming, everybody. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, all lovely participants. So our last introductory question today is, what do we consider when we develop our materials? Um, Gabriela, you first. Uh, <laughs> what do I consider now and what I used to consider? Uh, that's two different things. Uh, but I think a natural thing to all of us is that we think, uh, no matter what we do, uh, is we think about it uh, from the professional perspective. And again, if it's in the classroom, it's, you know, it's the pedagogy of language instruction or content instruction, depending where we do. And if it's in, in other contexts, if as, as, as a chair department, maybe I, I think about, um, um, I think about uh, what I want to communicate with my people and, um, and how I want them to see it. But what challenges do I, uh, do I face when I create my own materials? Uh, time, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, it's always an issue. It's like I read this somewhere. One thing that we all have in common is we never have enough time. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, when I think of um, uh, materials for language teaching, sometimes it's the content, like, uh, and then copyright. Those are some challenges. How, like, I don't, like... <sighs> You know, references, citing when I borrow, when I include, when I can, when I want to include something that I found online, uh, that I see in one book, and how, and if I modify it, so I kind of struggle with how to do this correctly and properly by recognizing the authors, and it's always sometimes a challenge. How do I do it so it doesn't completely ruin the whole document? So how do I 
basically cite and refer to sources and documents for language learners and what extent and how do I work with this, right? Um, and another one uh, is I, um, it's not anymore, but sometimes what the ch what challenges me is my ability to use word. Now I've advanced by working on my book on document design. I advanced so much in what I can do in word. My colleague who was doing it in in Adobe uh, product, he he couldn't believe what I can do in word. Um, but I, you know, using technology to serve what I need to, or to to do what I need to do is another challenge and. Um, and uh, I guess, and then of course, uh, knowing what to put in, but pedagogy is the first thing. Um, what do we consider? I'm addressing the second question as well. I'm sorry, Uma, I jumped into the second. What do you consider? I consider pedagogy and those are the challenges that I have. I'm sorry, I cannot address the second question that comes after this, but, but in all this, it's the pedagogy that I consider. Uh, and then it's the, um, it's the goals of, of the material, which are two things. And of course, now I think about the packaging and uh, and then when I think about it too much, it it takes uh, <clears throat> a lot of time, but, um, but I consider the content, my audience, and I wanna package it and what impact I wanna have um, and make with the material. And sorry about, I jumped on to the second question. They seem to, to be so interrelated. They are, right? <laughs> yes. We consider the challenges and how to solve them before working on, <laughs> on finding those solutions and preparing our, um, our materials for sure, right? So it's our students at the forefront and then the content and last, how to package it. Mm -hmm. Any other perceptions? What, what do you think? What is it that you take into account? What is it that you consider? What are your first observations when you start preparing materials. Mm. Consider all learning styles, as Sherfan is saying. Mm -hmm. All our students coming from different backgrounds and having different learning styles. And as Susan mentioned, accessibility, access. Are all my students going to access this material, right? How user-friendly it is, how student-friendly is this material? Um, Using plain and clear language and in instructions, as Francine is saying. Um, Chinwendu mentioned student levels and how best to pass the message across. How can I be clear? I think that's our everyday challenge. See, we go back to challenge, right? So they are interrelated. This is the struggle being able to be understood, right? Using plain language and clear language. Um, Alina is saying, my learners, that's what you consider. You consider your learners, your students. Time, how much time do I have to prepare? Resources I have on hand and how to put it together. Right. Interesting. Thank you, everybody. Other ideas? Anyone who would like to take the floor and use your microphone and share with us uh, other considerations you have when you develop your, your materials? Anything else in particular? I think we haven't. Oh, Victoria. Oh, but Victoria. I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then yeah. I'll add something. Oh, sure. <laughs> Thank you. I actually wanted to stress a little bit on learning systems because I truly believe the opportunity of working online, it helps everyone to see more potential. And uh, even, you know what, just when we speak about citing, right? Actually, technologies help us greatly with that. When checking, copy pasting and stuff, let's say such things as turn it in, this is the best tool for the teacher. I actually spend much less time than I used to do it before, right? Especially when they submit essays and stuff. And uh, by the way, I would say for students, it also works, right? Uh, we always share the resources before they submit so that they could check, check punctuation. And what I see, you know, in the last two years, I have seen great boost in the way how submissions have become much higher level. This is, this is my observation. So because college students, you know, but actually they're international students. That's what I see when they come with language. So I truly believe this uh, use of learning systems is very helpful for us as teachers. Thank you. Digital development of materials. Thank you, Victoria. Gabriela? 
you want to I was going to add, add it's, it, I haven't had this concern um, uh, or I had to consider for the past two years, but it was always the copy machine and the number of copies I need to make for, <laughs> you know, of any material and paper and, and copy machine. I mean, that was the, you know, size and choosing between black and white and wanting color on mine and not getting it because it's expensive. So, oh. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we haven't done this for some time. Um, uh, hopefully it will we'll go back to it soon in a certain way, but um, definitely a consideration. Resources. Right. Oh, yes. We're using last resources being that everything is now digital and no worries with colors anymore. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Um, Mary did point us back to the material being rich. Um, so I don't want to use it for only a minute, right? When we, and that's connected to time, right? When we prepare materials, we want it to be functional for other classes as well, not just for this, this particular one. Um, Jem Geronimo is saying, I consider its applicability to real life situations. So connecting our materials to real life situations so that they are um, profitable for our students. Great. This is lovely. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your contributions. And now we'll start with discussion questions. Over to you, Uma. Well, welcome to our discussion questions. Yeah. <laughs> As Gabriela said, she has <laughs> part of it. So do you want to discuss it or I can pass on to our next question? Uh, I, mean, be, I think it'd be interesting uh, to hear from people what challenges I shared the couple of mine kind of integrated in with the previous question, but I would be, uh, would be curious to hear what challenges people feel that they have in, in, in their context. Well, I'm reading out loud the question. What challenges do we face when we create our own materials? Yeah. So, uh, Gabriela, you are welcome to, I mean, paraphrase or summarize what you have said and then move on to uh, it, the, yeah, there was the it was the consideration and challenge of copy machine, um, but also my skills, right? Uh, challenges, and I talk about copyright issues um, as well, and I talk about time resources and overall resources in general as being something that uh, can become a challenge. And uh, <clears throat> what else is a challenge for me? Sometimes I get too obsessed with it. So, um, with, uh, and I spend uh, uh, too much time. Um, so I myself become the challenge in the whole process. So overcoming my myself in the process. Um, those are, I think, some of, some of my things. Right. Mm. And we'll also talk about the solutions to these challenges in a minute. So bear with us. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so time uh, remains one of the challenges that, and as Gonul is also saying in our chat box, could be time consuming, right? So it goes back to how much time do I have and what are the objectives I'm going to achieve with this material? Is the time spent worth it, right? Uh, Jackie is sharing with us that um, Jackie finds it difficult to not plagiarize even accidentally. The copyright that Gabriela was mentioning earlier, you find a great idea and they use it without realizing that it was from someone else. Mm -hmm. We become the students, right? <laughs> um, Francine, the learning curve of trying to use something that's new to me, such as the Canva <laughs> that the host is using. Uh, we feel that scared at fear of trying out something new like I've never done this how will this go should I try it right overcoming that fear is a real challenge so true thank you Francine for sharing that Zelda in multi-level classes adjusting the level of the material is a challenge so what works for one level does not work for the other and I would also add to that Zelda that whatever works for one level might not still work for that same level because the students are different, right? And, and we talked about different uh, levels of our learners who come from different backgrounds and who share different experiences. So that's absolutely true, right? But especially if you have a multi-level class, that is hard. Susan, uh, dare I say a possible issue may be support of administration. Wow. Mm -hmm. I cannot agree more with that, Susan. That's so true. Sometimes um, that happens. We are asked to design material, but there's no support, right? Mm -hmm. And there's agreement from others. 
Great. Um, anyone else? Any other ideas? So many challenges, we all agree, but since we're designing materials, we have overcome those challenges, right? <laughs> since we're all designing, we mentioned that we're all creators and designers. No fear of challenges, for sure. Great, thank you. Thank you for this. Uh, Uma, let's move on to our next discussion question. So our next, dis next discussion question is, what steps should we take when we start to design something? And what are the basic principles for document design? Okay. Um... I'll, I'll try to be, um, I mean, we cannot share all the things that are valuable for, for the process, but we'll, we'll stick with the, that design equals planning, right? And um, uh, to design is to plan the document uh, from the beginning to the end. And the process, the way I, um, the, the first thing I think that we have to consider is the, the rhetorical context. Um, and that's uh, what am I presenting? Why am I presenting it? And uh, it doesn't matter if it's for language learners or for any other audience and um, when and where will it be read or interacted with. So those are, so I have to see because all those things kind of shaped uh, uh, the look of the document. Um, and it's like in the classroom, when we are planning a lesson, we need to think about our students. We need to think about our, our goals. We need to think about, um, you know, if it's a morning class or an evening class, we need to consider certain circumstances of our lesson plan or context and it's in a similar way with the document design I need to consider this uh, and invite uh, and invite to a garden party for primary school kids will be very different from an invite uh, <clears throat> uh, to a old school meeting um, you know but it's still an invitation so it has some features and certain elements but then I have to consider the context another example would be when and where it will be interacted with I often say will the students have the document in 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 class or will it be something that they'll use at home will there be any support and guidance on the part of the teacher and those are some of the things uh, um, that we need to uh, we need to think about so the rhetorical situation is the first one but it, and then it gets to like um, and in the lesson planning, I have some ideas, I have some activities. So I create an inventory of all the information that I wanna include, all the texts that I wanna uh, have. And what, the way I usually do it is I throw it all in Word document, no matter what I, what I design. Now I started using Canva as well and um, for certain things because it's, it has some elements that I don't find in Word, but I'll throw the text all together. And then I start thinking about the text. And some of the things that I need to think about is I need to think about the hierarchy. And that's a key principle in document design. And by hierarchy, it means what is the most important, less important, the least important in the document for the audience, serving the purpose that, I, um, uh, that I'm creating the document for. And um, so I think of the hierarchy and the organization. So I create... You know, I know what's important and what's less important and I create certain groups. So uh, what do I want the audience to see first and second and third? Uh, what is the hierarchy of the content? As I said, uh, how can I organize it and uh, structure it? Uh, and what do I want? What feeling do I want the document to communicate? Do I want it to be a serious business or do I want it to be open and fun um, looking document? What, what is it? Uh, what mode uh, do I want to uh, uh, the document to create? So I those are some of the things that I consider. But I always think that the the hierarchy is a key uh, key element. Then uh, there are some other princ design principles, and there's over 120 design principles. Uh, Francine, that's for you to know when you work with the designers. Okay, it's it's like it's incredible. There are books on principles, but in my book and in general, I think the six that I work with the most often is that as I said, the principle is hierarchy categorizing information based on importance. And the uh, second one is similarity. So uh, using the same visual code for information that is of the same similar kind, okay? And then another one is contrast. And by contrast, I mean like, and that supports the hierarchy, right? And a contrast is not 10 and 12 point um, font size. Contrast is 16 and 10. 
then I increase the scent. And then by doing that, I increase the contrast, um, very simply. And then uh, my favorite principle is proximity. So by principle of proximity, you'll remember this one easily, is that things that are close to each other, we automatically assume that they're related. And if they are far apart, like people on a bus, we know that they're not related, right? Two who they like uh, each other, they're together, and we assume a couple, and then uh, not a couple. And by, uh, by proximity, we help the learners to see what is related to what. If I have a picture and a text and it's far apart, the learner doesn't associate that the description maybe fits with the picture. But if it's close to the picture, I know it's a description of the picture. So that's um, the principle of proximity. And there's two more. There's alignment. When you look at the screen right now, all the boxes are nicely aligned. All the frames for the are nicely aligned. It means that there's a certain line that they follow. And by accidentally throwing things on a page doesn't help our eyes to read and follow, um, follow the information. And the last one is repetition. It's sim similar to similarity, but repetition is that we repeat certain elements um, throughout, um, uh, throughout the document or across documents. Okay, so that's another one that I think is really important, especially if let's say that we always have a little checklist for, for somebody. If it's a checklist, let's keep the same design to our checklist. No, let's not be creative all the time. <laughs> okay, let's keep, and then, then be, it becomes a certain um, genre specific visual elements. And by seeing the same, the learners will automatically know that it's a certain document and we don't have to provide too much explanation. So uh, in this PowerPoint presentation that Uma uh, put together, every single slide has a repetition. It's a question, it has an image. And it's repeated throughout the slide, uh, throughout the presentation. So there is this rhythm that the repetition also creates to whatever we create. So I'll summarize. I know some maybe you're taking notes, and you can Google these principles, or um, and it's the principle of hierarchy, the most important, distinguishing what matters and uh, what doesn't matter that much. Um, similarity and um, a contrast and uh, proximity alignment and repetition. So I apply these principles, then I play with some tools. Uh, then I look at it, I print it. If it's uh, on paper, I print it, I look at it, like it, don't like it, <laughs> review it, and then I fine tune it. But the important thing is that I don't start designing until I have all the information that I wanna include in the material. And after that, I start categorizing the information and helping and thinking of what visuals I need to support. And I start playing with it. I'll stop now. Um, that was a quick five minute into document design. But very, very insightful and very practical. Thank you. I took notes of those. Um, and I'm sure we all practice designing material and we all do that, but maybe we didn't know them in theory or did not pay my atten much attention to one or the other. So thank you, Gabriela, for sharing, uh, for sharing your principles. And um, I'm sure that they will be helpful to all of us. Um, Gonul is saying using bold, right? We mentioned contrast, uh, graphics and repeating those graphics and that's um, with repetition and similarity, visuals, right? Also using primary colors. Susan is saying that actually some colors are better for people who experience color blindness. Mm -hmm. Going back to access and accessibility and having that in mind, Absolutely. Uh, Debbie is moving on to emphasis, balance, alignment, repetition, contrast, and white space. We do need white space for relaxation as well, right? Um, share fun, relevance, the content, readability, mm -hmm. access again, and simple, uncluttered. Absolutely. Great ideas. Mm -hmm. We may saying that hierarchy is what is most important to her and yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So any, anyone else would like to, to add anything? Great tips. Thank you, Gabriela. Uh, Francine, I try to keep hierarchy in mind when writing emails too. So what is the most important and what is the least important? Getting the message across, right? So hierarchy and content closely related. Mm -hmm. So does it mean, Francine, that you uh, that you actually uh, use um, you play with the visual look, or is it the order of information? The the important comes first. 
Um, I learned something a while ago that in the days when we wrote letters all the time, you you made your um, important point at the very end. So you did all this preamble of why you're asking for what you're asking for. And then when we go into the email world, we reverse it. Get to your point in the beginning and then justify it afterwards. And I keep that reversed idea in my mind. I find some people write paragraphs in an email and at the end it's, um, so could you do this on Tuesday? I want to know that first. So that, that's mm -hmm. what I was thinking of then. I, I thought you're using formatting in HTML or you're using some, you know, like that you, you put it in bold or you put it in color or something, but it's the, um, it's the order of information. Yes, yes. And I, I think it also goes back to the audience, right? So there are times when we play around with bold or color coding in emails as well, right? So depending on, on hierarchy, on importance and relevance. So we try to get our message across and also attract attention. Thank you. Thank you, Francine. Thank you, everybody, for your great comments and for sharing your own experience on, on document design. Great. So let's move on then to our next question, Uma. I hope you'll all enjoy this question we have prepared so far, the tools. Mm -hmm. tools. What tools do we have available when we design something? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's interesting in the in in the chat and what has been said. Uh, uh, and I again uh, draw an um, analogy between language teaching and the design. In language teaching, we have principles of second language in, um, acquisition that inform what we do with language learners. And in a similar way, the principles that I introduced um, with the previous question, the hierarchy and the proximity, are some general universal principles that have been found as, as valuable and useful. And if they're applied, um, and you can start looking around, I would say, you know, look around and see what principles do you see on a book cover that's lying on your table right now. Okay, and, uh, but those are the principles that guide the mind of the designer. And then we have some tools that help us to achieve um, uh, that we apply the principles uh, with, or uh, like we do in the classroom, we have different activities, but we do certain things with them to really uh, match the principles of second language acquisition. Uh, so it's kind of hands in hand. And what I think we have, and many of those have been said here, uh, this will be difficult. I wonder if you have something to add to it, but a key one is color, right? Color, um, maybe there is some perception of color. Um, uh, different people see, uh, have different colors, have different connotations across different cultures, but color is definitely a tool I can use to show uh, uh, similarity or to show contrast. Another one, believe it or not, is an false in, in um, is, is uh, headings. Sometimes headings uh, are uh, considered a, like a type element, but headings, which is, which is a textual thing, also helps to structure the design. And by, uh, by uh, applying some of these principles, like I keep a, I always have a certain type of heading um, in my document, um, that can kind of support the communication of the document. Another tool that I have is type. And uh, we have, I'm sure you know this, serif and um, uh, non-serif fonts, uh, sans-serif fonts uh, that we can use. And uh, the, the software that we use have, um, has a lot of options. Canva offers a variety of uh, type um, that we can, uh, we can use. And another element is numbers and letters, believe it or not. Numbers and letters, numbering and lettering things, but then doing a, a 10 uh, items that are bulleted. And if you use numbers, just using that little tool that we have available can really improve the navigation of the document by referencing to it. Um, uh, it's easier for referencing. We have different symbols and icons, either through Word or we can seek some on, online. We have the different boxes we can use uh, or lines uh, and borders. We also have a header and footer. One thing that I keep forgetting is, I keep forgetting including page numbers if I have more than one page. Okay, a very important element for somebody who prints out the document. But believe it or not, that's my, always forget. And then I myself struggle which one, which page is first and second and third. Another one, and it came here is the space, the white space. White space is not absence of text. White space is tool and it, it's powerful in design. 
and um, and and graphics is another one, um, and it can be illustrations or pictures, whatever. And the overall layout, how I put things on 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 the page or whatever size of I choose or on the screen, that's another element. So those are some of the tools, and maybe um, those are some of the tools that we have available. Thank you, thank you, Gabriela. So many tools, right? That we sometimes take for granted and think they're not there for us, right? To use, um, but they have power, right? There, there's power behind those tools and they make the whole difference when it comes to how our students are going to perceive or anybody, our audience in general, is going to perceive and interact with, with the material. Any other tools you use? Um, that are your favorite or that you have experimented, like using lines or color coding, as we mentioned. Uh, Gunul agrees that page number is so important. That's, that's very important indeed, especially when you print them out. And when I forget doing that, as Gabriela said, it's a nightmare. I'm like, which, yeah, okay. So <laughs> let's order this now, right? Mm -hmm. Any other tips you have? Any other strategies you use when it comes to tools? Victoria, yes, please. Uh, I agree with Everson. All, <laughs> all is correct. Uh, I wanted a little bit to comment on colors. Uh, I like a little bit, again, unification. Let's say all my lectures have uh, absolutely the same, the material, it has specific graphics, right? And let's say I always stress that when I put something red, it's always the same font in all the lectures. It means that students know that they have to learn it by heart. And if I put something, let's say like an example, it's always green, it's the same style and it helps them to understand. So for me, it works well. So if you find it also useful, so, but, but I agree, just numbering slides, just pages and documents, yes, 100%. Clear and I remember I also, you know, Gabriella uh, once uh, really I gave some type of assignment, but actually I forgot putting page numbers and the three quarters. Uh, they did something absolutely different. It was such a nice lesson that after that I always remember that. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree with you. It's just a very powerful tool. Thank you. That's why we love mistakes. We learn from them, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Yes, Victoria, and, and I do the same in my course, uh, online course. What I do is that every assignment is in red so that students know that if it's in red, they need to click on and submit their work. And we're talking of weekly assignments. So it's hard to, to be organized and my students love it. They're like, okay, we know. It keeps them on track. Uh, Meredith, Victoria, what level are you teaching where you color code or for all levels? So Meredith has a question uh, for you. For all, for all, for yes, all. It doesn't all. matter. It doesn't matter whether it's business, English, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? For mm -hmm. all. Yes, yeah, same but for But actually, me. it's easier for me. It's easier mm. for me, right? Because I have mm -hmm. created my system mm -hmm. and all people, they also get used to it very easily. Right. Uh, and, and I agree. Sometimes we think that colors work only for children or, or younger but kids, right? But no, I think colors are helpful to everybody, especially when you have the codes, right? You... You have a code that the students know and respect and follow, right? I think one thing I didn't say is that all the tool, all the things that we have available interact with each other. And I have to um, think carefully about how I use a color is good, um, but I also have to think what kind of type I use to put, put in color and other things. So it's all interrelated and it can have, you know, there's no right or wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is, uh, but it, it's 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 like cooking a meal. I have to consider the different ingredients to create the right taste um, at the end, and the same way I do it. But I, I was kind of thinking um, that maybe uh, people. I I talk about tools that we have available in Word, but I would be interested to hear what tools online people use to kind of design their materials, or what would you know? Kind of we've already mentioned Canva, but what other software or applications you use to to do your things? Maybe we can expand our, you know. Um, list of tools that go beyond the, the specific um, ones that it, we can use in design. Mm -hmm. uh, Francine has a question for you, Gabriela. I want mm -hmm. to color um, <clears throat> any examples of certain cultures that have issues with certain colors. 
I mean, uh, typically is one is red, right? The connotation of red is uh, is uh, can mean something. Uh, I mean, uh, for me, it's uh, explanation, but I believe in uh, like, and it reminds for me, it has some connotation with the past of the Czech Republic, um, and uh, in others, it is preferred color. So it's. Um, I haven't done um, most of the information in professional writing comes from um, North America studies. I haven't done, um, but there is some research. I can I can look it up as we are looking at the other questions. For instance, um, I have a couple of ideas in the book, but I don't remember them specifically um, mm -hmm. since I'm back in in Europe or Central Europe, which is very homogeneous. Um, um, I don't have to think about this too much. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. It's not the same in Canada, right? Because we have so many uh, different cultures in the same exact classroom. And um, that's important to have in mind. Uh, Ganul is saying the students love the step process, right? Step one, step two. I usually use numbers um, for the steps when necessary. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it guides them, right? And even when the instructor is not there, they know that this is the order they need to com to complete their tasks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gonol. Any other ideas or tools? Like Adobe, we mentioned some uh, might use Adobe, some use Word, Canva, PowerPoint, Google Docs, any other? specific tool that you enjoy using? Victoria. Mm -hmm. Actually, I use a lot of videos. I uh, offer students to create presentations in Prezi because actually they can um, create small cartoons and it works nice, especially for high school. They're very professional in Canada with that. Um, uh, Zoom classes, I like polls. Actually, this uh, function is very useful. It's very fast. And even um, with Zoom, I also like to make small groups, chat groups, so it helps a lot. And even if some students have private questions while we all are working online, it's great too, because you can make a separate group with the person and the rest are doing tours. But actually, I try um, to teach students to use more technologies, of course, uh, actually, it makes my work easier and it makes their work easier and it gives them more potential right now to communicate. Right now, because we are more like online, right? Of course, live communication, this is different. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, what I found that it can be as productive as, let's say, I was trying to, you know, just use all these instructional design principles in class. Right now, I find more and more ways how to introduce and how to keep attention just of students. And in my case, my classes last about three hours, so nonstop. So actually, I have to practice a lot of things to keep their attention. So, but technologies are great, right? Mm -hmm. So, and actually we use a lot of learning systems in our college. We actually, one of them is just Schoology and it has lots of access to resources as well. And we constantly share with my colleagues who is using what, who is doing what. And it's helpful because some things are really free and they have great database. Something just, uh, we have very supportive management. And actually, if I need something, I just make a request and actually, no, if of, of course it's not super duper expensive, actually we are paid, so we are supported and that's great. So thank you. Great, right. <laughs> thank you. Nice. Thank you, Victoria, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also see many tools, Google Slides for interactive, uh, interactive activities, True. especially the text boxes for each student, a whiteboard in Zoom class. Mm -hmm. And we're also teaching students on how to use them, right? So when we send them to breakout rooms, we also remind them to use the whiteboard or to share the screen with one another and make use of the tools while they have them. Mm -hmm. H5P is a, is a new tool that's now has been around for some time and um, many um, school boards or institutions are using it. Great, so there are many tools. Um, but we have to feel comfortable using them, right? And at the same time, try them out. <laughs> uh, and I would, I would add, like especially with Canva, uh, sometimes the tool has so many options and possibilities that we we go for what we like and we think, and 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 then maybe forget the principles that we have to really. 
I mean, they're well designed, but sometimes if you have a in, uh, sometimes I use it for Instagram posts, it's like you have a photograph and then you have text over a photograph, right? Uh, you really have to think about whether all the letters of the text are um, visible. clear, visible, and there's enough contrast, right? And um, it may not be always the truth. So we always end up using, we always have to think uh, for ourselves and for what we are doing. And those are our only tools that we can explore um, to maybe support us in our processes. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Uma, let's move on to our next question. So our next question is what common mistakes we do make in document design? Yeah, as Loretta says, she loves mistakes. <laughs> yes. What common mistakes we do make in document design? Yes, Gabriela, your tips. Um, yeah, it's and 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 as like as educators, we don't like to focus on mistakes, right? Uh, uh, because mistakes are, are a sign of learning. Uh, but I, I feel like, um, and my experience is that maybe we in, in our schools or our teacher preparation programs or in our education, we do, really don't learn how to do these things. We don't learn how to design effectively. And because of lack of knowledge, we do something that we think <laughs> is correct. And um, so good intentions behind um, my, uh, this is horrible, but one of my activities when I want to entertain myself, which I haven't done for some time, is I just put in, I just put in an ESL worksheet and Google and then I look at the images and and I'm just fascinated by the scope of creativity um, in the educational world in a good way and maybe not so good way by good intentions we create obstacles for our learners um, or even for our readers whatever materials we create we, and some of, one clear um, uh, a common mistake is definitely violating the idea of hierarchy where the, the hierarchy of the document is not clear to us by having a first look, you don't, I don't know what's most important in this document. I don't know where to put my eyes because the hierarchy navigates uh, our eyes and effective documents help to navigate our eyes to kind of get to the information that we need to get to. Um, so that's definitely one. So when you look at what you have in front of you, if you now went to a document that you just recently created on your computer that you're on, it would be interesting to see <laughs> what, what did I do in this? Okay, how did I communicate the hierarchy of the document? And did I use contrast to really clearly to show the hierarchy? Um, Another one is that we're not consistent. Victoria said she's very consistent using color, but we're inconsistent in the use of various visual elements. Okay, we design something one week, two weeks later, we designed a similar document and we don't remember what we did. So we put in other things. So what I now, um, so inconsistency across documents and within one document. And, and, and this is fun. You look at that a teacher, first activity, one type of font, okay. <laughs> Third activity on the page, a different one. And you wonder, is this a mistake or is this intentional? So inconsistency and the same thing should look the same. Uh, and then another one, my favorite one is that they're so crowded and too busy. And, um, and I really like another metaphor. I like the documents and not because I like them because I think they're easy to navigate. It's like, if you go to a, a, a store, a fashion store and you have based, you, when you have the lower scale fashion stores, there's this overflow of items, right? It's like packed, like at least here in the Czech Republic, some of the stores, like, I don't know where to look. Like, it's like, where to, what to get? You know, I have a hard time navigating. And then you go to uh, upscale fashion stores and there's like three shirts on, and then you know what you want to get and it, um, and what you where you can find it. And I think it's the same uh, situation. Sometimes our documents have so much and that white space that we mentioned earlier is not there. <laughs> that uh, we don't, the, the, the learners um, or the readers um, don't know where to go and where to put their eyes. Um, so very crowded. Uh, another one is too many visual elements. This is typical for primary, <laughs> primary school teachers. <laughs> they like to put in little doodles or little things and we wanna be supportive. So we put a happy, happy face somewhere, you know, or we put a little heart maybe not that often, but we like the happy, we would like to encourage students by including funny and fun, happy images. Um, as I said, another mistake is that uh, it's harder, hard to navigate the document. The numbering that was mentioned in the chat uh, uh, 
uh, numbering, very common uh, uh, contrast not present related to hierarchy. That's another one. Uh, <clears throat> uh, sometimes we, we, we don't like that white space that on the page. So we throw in something like a big picture and idea and we don't think about the relevance um, of the picture to what it says. And I have a favorite, my favorite one is, this was in a test, there was a picture of a kid on a scooter and uh, it was next to a story about the kid's birthday, but there was nothing about the scooter in the text or something. So it completely misled the, um, the learners. Uh, Another uh, pretty common can be that there is not enough contrast between the font and the background when we are putting a text over something or when we're using color. And another one that's uh, my favorite, it's uh, call it typewriter leftovers. That may be, it's not the uh, younger generation, but those of us who still remember typewriters um, is that there is not that much formatting options that we had. So what you had, to, you only had the options starting on the left, starting in the middle, <laughs> Okay, that's how you created uh, contrast, right? So sometimes people still put a lot of things in the middle of the page, the headings or the titles in the middle of the page. Yes, it can be in the middle of the page, but our eyes have to go all the way to the middle to identify it, right? We can create the contrast. We have other tools available. Another one is underlying text. Fabulous thing. Um, all, we all underline our text. No, that's left over. By underlying text on a typewriter, you show that that was important. Now we can use other um, tools. And another one is all caps. <laughs> Beyond one word, right? If you have a text in all caps, again, very, very difficult, very difficult to follow. And the very last one, and I'll, um, uh, 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 there's some discussion going on in the chat, but the last one is that we ignore the purpose on use of the document. Okay, so sometimes we end up with an activity that has two parts and one is on one page and the second part is on the other page. So the kids, the students go like, you know, they keep flipping the, the document because one thing like ideally word bank is on one side and a close activity is on the other side, right? That's the, so we don't think about the purpose. We break the text at a certain point where it's not uh, well done. And, um, or another one is like when you have a page Sometimes when you fold it, right? And sometimes when there's text in the middle, it makes the text harder to read when you open it up. So those are some examples. And I'll share a link to a blog that I uh, did for TSOL that has the most common flaws and fixes uh, for the audience to have some content knowledge. Uh, but I would be happy to see what, what, it, what are your experiences? What have you seen in design? Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, the blog link will be very interesting for everybody, uh, but also for sharing uh, practical examples. I remember once um, it was an assessment. So I had designed an ass assessment and then printed it out. So the student had to flip the page to see the other part of the task. She forgot it, although I reminded, I, I knew she would forget it. And I was reminding her and, and some other ones. And at the end, when I checked, she had still forgotten to flip the page and see that there was a second part to it. So that taught me well, right? The next time I designed the assessment, I knew. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of conversation going on. Uh, so clutter, you know, Susan is saying clutter is a problem, too much information and lack of consistency. Mm -hmm. um, Gabriela shared the blog with all of us, too many fonts, right? which are different, right? Mm -hmm. Blocks of text in italics or in fonts that look like fancy handwriting, but that are difficult to read, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's so true, Francine. Yeah, true. Mistakes we learn from, that's what matters. Changing and adapting and improving our designs. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Any other ideas? Anything in particular you'd like to share with us? They're right. all looking. They're looking at the link now. I'm yeah, sure. they are. <laughs> that at the end, I right? did what we we're not supposed to do with <laughs> learners, yeah. right? Send them the link while we talk. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah. as you're looking at the at the blog, is there anything that resonates with you? Do you see your materials? Can you connect your materials uh, to any of those flaws? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm 
Yeah. Okay. That's that's okay. We can move on to our other question, Uma. Yes. Two more questions, and then we'll have a breakout room activity for you. So, good timing. Thank you. Okay. So our next question is, what shapes the design of our materials? What shapes the design of our materials, Gabriella? Uh, we, we, it's kind of like a summarize it because we, we talked about it, right? And um, we all have, uh, uh, whatever you're creating, we have some content or some information, and then we have some, and with language learners, it's some pedagogy, and then we have the design. And the design, uh, and actually, I think even the information and the pedagogy all depend on, uh, on the, um, I'll have four question words, what? Uh, what type of content do I want to present and share with the learn with the audience? Uh, am I am I uh, presenting instructions for an online language task or a vocabulary practice activity or an invite to a meeting or um, a reading text or performance criteria? So what I have to think is what the content is, what information is there? And I said earlier, it's we we create an inventory of all the information. What so what is it that I'm doing? Because all these things will shape the look of the material. The second one, and which is connected with the what, is the why. What is the purpose of the material? Um, what do I want uh, by the, the design to achieve? And uh, do I want to guide students to something? Maybe that will shape it a little bit. Do I want it, um, it to be as a, as a point of reference for something? What is the why? What is the purpose? What will the students do with the or the readers um, with the material? Um, and then it's the who, the audience, the age matters, the language experience matters, right? The language background, the education, uh, the knowledge of the subject matter, all of these things. Uh, we have a tendency that um, um, with lower level learners, um, we don't put that much text. And with more advanced students, we have more text. Maybe, <laughs> um, maybe it should always be a decent amount of text on a page for no matter what language level you are. I mean, depending on do we want to overwhelm the learners or not. Um, uh, and the last one is uh, the how, and I already talked about it. How will the material be used uh, inside, outside the classroom? Will it be displayed? Will it be used on a mobile device? Will it be used on a computer screen? How will it be used? How will the students interact with it? And, um, and those are some keys. So what, why, who, and how? And those are the general considerations. Um, uh, and one thing that I didn't mention or I've mentioned, there are certain conventions that we have to recognize. So maybe your institution has certain conventions that you wanna follow and implement, like always using a logo or something. So maybe internal visual language uh, manuals or what is it that you should always have there um, that is needed and re recognized in, the, um, in your institution. But the conventions themselves are culture bound and going back to Francine's question, I, I only have in the book that I had uh, in one research study that the different associations with the color ping, that the ping has different associations across cultures, but, but it also applies to use of paper, um, you know, how much you put on a page a Czech person would see an empty page as a waste of money. Okay, whereas I think empty page is supports the learner, but I have to, we have to think how, what the perception is being wasteful or not wasteful. Uh, uh, if you have uh, different cultures, the research shows, I have it here that uh, the French and the Dutch uh, um, uh, prefer sans serif fonts, whereas Americans like uh, serif fonts. So I have to look at what the use is. And, but when you have a multilingual, multicultural group, um, and you're in Canada, um, uh, I would always check more legibility and um, function of the particle thing than think deeply about what is it in their culture. Because I think it, our visual taste and our visual experiences you know, grow as we are exposed to more and more of what the context offers. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The what, the why, the who, and the how. Very important questions to have in mind. And yes, as Gabriela was saying, there are institutions that have rules and guidelines that um, as members we need to respect, right? Especially when it comes to access and accessibility for, for our students. Um, and depending on the LMS, on the learning management system we use, there are also 
now they are implementing tools that actually tell you the percentage of accessibility you have in the document you have published for your students online. So there are very nice tools indeed being used more and more. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Ome saying challenges in fitting in one page I face while teaching and learning in graph and chart. Mm -hmm. Right, so making those decisions, should I delete this, but I need this, right? So how can I uh, divide the material into, an, or at least how can I fit it in one single page while having white space? Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. Um, any, I know we covered this, I know, um, right? We talked a lot over use of acronyms. Yes. Uh, thank you, Shiraz, especially with new people, right? New students in our classroom. Gabriela, what do you think of acronyms, the content here, the what? Mm. Yeah, they always, they always stop you, right? I mean, mm. it's, it's all like, unless you have it under your skin, like acquired, it kind of always, you, what is it? What is it? What is it? Right. Uh, um, but that kind of nicely shows the interconnection between the text and the wrapping. Okay, so I have to, even when I look at it, I have to also think about the text. And sometimes, um, you know, maybe sometimes you want to reward your instructions. Maybe you realize you have so much in your instructions, you don't need all these things as you revise it. So it's not only the visual packaging, the, 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 the font and the colors and the white space, um, but it's also the text itself. Sometimes there's too much maybe, um, but definitely overuse of acronyms. Ooh. Yes. Obstacle. <laughs> Great. Time and budget, as Susan is saying. Mm -hmm. that, that shapes that shapes the design. <laughs> it all depends on, on money and time. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, I'm aware of the time, so it's 11.16. Um, involve the end users in the design. That's a great tip, Shiraz. Right? Involve our students, right? Mm-hmm involve our audience in the design, why not? I do ask my students, what color do you want me to code your tasks? <laughs> and we choose it, it's a poll and they choose it. So we agree. Mm. Gabriela, what do you think of this, involving the end users? Mm. It's not always possible, I think, is it? No, it's, it, it has to, there's something, there's a tool that is done in professional writing, it's called usability testing. Mm -hmm. uh, so you basically interact, uh, uh, you provide a certain material uh, you potential audience and, and you observe their behavior and performance and uh, their activity. And now with the eye, eye movement, you can actually kind of see where the eyes are, go and when they look on a page and then you can track that and, uh, you know, improve, but that's the, that's the research, but usability testing, seeing, you know, like you're creating a flyer or something, you throw it to three or four people, you ask them three questions. When is it happening? What time, what time is it? And all these things. And then it gives you feedback. So definitely involving, uh, involving and, but from the usability perspective, okay, right. is, it, is this user-friendly? Is this accessible? Do I have access to it? What feelings does it give you? Um, definitely feedback, you know, um, getting feedback on, on our designs, yes. Piloting it probably, mm -hmm. right, thank you. Great discussions, thank you very much. Okay, because it's 11.17, let's immediately go to our breakout room activity now. Um, Uma will share the question on our screen and I'll be sending you into breakout rooms. We'll spend some time. Um, we will give you around um, seven minutes <laughs> talking with one another um, and then you'll share your ideas with us. The other breakout room activity, Uma, let's move on. Mm -hmm. So this is the question. Do you think you're going to implement any of the concepts we discussed here? Which ones and why? So what
Room one is still talking. <laughs> um, this is I'm the best so- part, I guess. This is the best part of the hour and a half, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's never enough time for breakout rooms. But we accepted that time is the most challenging thing we have, right? <laughs> um, thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your time. Uh, so let's start with room one. We had Kulwinder, Lilia, Natalia, Sarah, Sarama, and, um, and Sarama. Yes. So do you have a speaker or would you like to share? What is it that you think you're going to implement um, in the very next assignment you're going to design or task or activity. So anything you'd like to share from room one? We talked about implementing the uh, ideas that Gabriella shared in our own teaching. And we also said that it's really important to um, kind of uh, demonstrate with our own materials that we de- uh, develop the expectations of the student papers that we would like them to submit, right? Like if we include our name and page number and like clear information is organized clearly, that's the uh, sample of what we expect the students to submit to us. Mm-hmm. Great, thank you. Anyone else from room one, anything you'd like to add? Okay, good. You could also use the chat box or the microphone again. So let's move on to room two. Thank you so much, Natalia. So in room two, we had Cynthia, Cynthia, Francine, Jem, Joanna, Shazma, and Shiroz. Apologies for mispronunciation. Anyone who would like to share what you discussed in your room? I'm guessing they're waiting for me because Sorry. as usual, I was, I was muted. I was muted. I was just going to say Francine oh. shared a personal story uh, about, you know, how the, the activity could be split up between two pages could not just not just be like annoying, but physical constraints, you know, anybody with some disabilities or whatever. Mm-hmm. And if they're doing a test, the timing would be, you know, something that would be, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right. And then they don't see, they don't prepare themselves of of the next page, right? They think they're done. This is the only thing they need to complete. Or with carpal tunnel, whatever physical ability to move the page could take time, right? Right. Accessibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that way. Absolutely. Yes. I was saying that we usually talk, focus so much on color issues that especially if, well, anybody with any mobility issues, it's a different thing that we have to consider. Someone also mentioned too, um, indirectly about catering to the various device sizes. So many students viewing on phones and tablets versus a laptop or computer mm-hmm. and how design becomes more complicated trying to accommodate as many people as you can. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. And especially on the number of words you have on the page. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was was a very, I found a very interesting conversation in our room. (laughs) That's lovely to hear. Thank you, Francine. Thank you, uh, room two. So let's move on to room three. Uh, We had Shin Wendu, Debbie, Selda, and Gabriella as well. (laughs) So room three. (laughs) Um, Okay, I'll go first. And if my friends want to add something, we talked about phone. Ones. Okay, mm-hmm. we, we designed uh, materials, but we never thought about it before we said, I mean, the importance of fonts and these blank spaces on paper, and also color codes, all of us said we want to try because I don't use uh, I work with adults and I, I mean, I didn't think I would use it, but I will try, I'll try using color codes. And also Debbie talked about using PowerPoints. Um, yeah. That's basically mm-hmm. what we said in our group. If Thank anyone you. else wants to add something else. Thank you, Selda. Yes, anyone else? So let's summarize everything then. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, room three. And moving on to our last room, uh, Devinder, Jennifer, Monica, and Susan. Anyone from your room to share your goals? 
Um, so uh, I will go first, and uh, uh, later if Monica or other friends of my group uh, mm -hmm. would like to share, they may share. I am really, really thankful to Gabriella for um, uh, holding this. Uh, the the points that were mentioned here were very important. We noted and. As Francine has uh, mentioned, that the use of device is also very important while designing. And as well, Selda um, uh, mentioned the color coding, which I am thinking of uh, incorporating in my designs. Nice. Thank you, Devinder. Thank you. Thank you for um, the for everyone for everything, the <laughs> sharing of thoughts and all. Our pleasure. Anyone else would like to add? Susan is saying, I was taught that serif enhance ease of eye tracking reading. Can Gabriela please comment on some serif? That, mm. sort of, that was sort of sidetracking the discussion that we had in, in, our, um, in mm. our group. That was mm -hmm. just sort of more, more a final question. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I agree with all the, all the points every, all the other groups have said as well. And uh, we, we did have a further discussion about white space the white space and clutter issue. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so should I address the, the, the question? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, please. I think that you should know, um, it's a little more complicated because what it depends is the, the size of the font uh, matters as well. Uh, the, the space between the, the, the lines, uh, the font, so it's more complicated. Okay, because if you, uh, it can support or it can be an obstacle. Because what I say always, the, the little, um, the little doo-doos uh, mm -hmm. around the letters, if there's not enough contrast, they kind of hinder. And the idea of font is that our eyes can see the line of the letters clearly. Um, and that can change based on, on, on the device or on print and the size. So it's, uh, we have to really look look at it and see what we want to achieve. You know, some people say now that if you were designing for the screen, use sans serif. But now with the higher re resolution, you can use serif because if the resolution supports the the our ability to um, craft and see the the the, the, the letters. So mm -hmm. no easy answer in design, uh, Susan. Sorry, but um, <laughs> it's it's a little more complex. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. It's just fascinating for me because I was thinking, well, if it has to do with physical eye tracking, then how would that explain the cultural differences you alluded to? Like, why is it different in France and the Netherlands as opposed to North America? Thanks again. Because Great the, 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 um, the choice of the type, okay, uh, is going to be culturally, um, like it's something that's common in the culture. And if it's common, people are more used to it and prefer it because they're used to it. So going to be one reason, but... <laughs> I, mean, this, I don't know the recent research. This is I'm talking about my professional past here today. <laughs> well, thank you for doing that. Thank you, Gabriela. Um, and thank you, everybody, for all your comments and insights. Um, Uma, if you could please share Gabriela's contact details, and then we'll move on to uh, our final and ending slides. Thank you for staying with us. So this is uh, Gabriela's email address for anyone that would like to um, address or any questions you have. Um, can mm -hmm. I, um, if, if, uh, the, the purpose of the talk was just to raise awareness and I'm glad to hear that many of you kind of are becoming more aware that this maybe matters. Like, mm. okay, maybe this is something I'm supposed to pay attention. It's not an easy field, but just, just little thinking about it. And if you, I, um, if you like got, um, interested in it, it's like, huh, I really don't know anything about it. I'm going to share, um, a link to the book, but it's, I'm not doing it just because I'm not making any any money on it it's just but it's more of a that i the synthesis and the way the book is put together um it's supposed to help you to learn the skills so it's not like about design but it guides you through the process of design so i'll put a link uh, it's you can buy it as an ebook but I, I, I don't like to do this selling myself but it's the content that i didn't have time to cover here that you can read there of course you can look up things free on different websites but um, here it's put together in relation to language learning, if you're interested. And again, um, the hardest part for me, I don't like to market my book, but because <laughs> of the content that I um, am very proud of, um, uh, um, that um, I'll, I'll, I'll share it here. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, Uma, thank you. Um, and now it's, uh, it's our closing slides. 
So thank you everybody for attending our session. Uh, the PD certificates for this session will be mailed to you uh, using the same email address that you used to register for the session. It will take up to seven days, so please stay with us until then. Um, there's a survey that will also be mailed to you the next business day. Please take the survey and give your honest opinion on the session. It will help us improve and get more content to you. Um, don't forget, we have upcoming events on February 15, 2022. Please register. It's a 7 to 8.30, our usual time event on a Tuesday, Understanding Gender and Sexual Diversity with Celeste Turner. And then on Saturday, March 12th, from 7 to 8.30 p.m. again, we have Promoting Active Reading with Online Social Annotation. Please go into our uh, website and register for these upcoming events. We hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you so much. From us at Tesla Ontario, thank you for joining us this Saturday morning, and I hope you enjoyed it. See you in other sessions, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.